Good evening, everyone. This is Eric White. I'm the Executive Director of the Boston Society of Architects and, and the BSA Foundation and the BSA. And I want to welcome you to our special meeting on uh, uh, this, this evening as we're kicking off the new uh, virtual BSA uh, during this time of social distancing and self-quarantine measures that have really escalated quickly. As firms move to work remotely, um, we wanted to, to see if we could reach out and share what uh, you can learn from others who have already integrated remote work into their structure and culture. We're pleased tonight to have uh, and welcome Cynthia Gibson Murphy, AIA, who is an associate partner and senior project man manager at Margulies Perucci Architects, and Diana Nicholas, AIA, who is president and CEO of SOM Architecture and is the secretary of the BSA uh, board. They have both established remote work as part of their practice and will share some of their challenges, tools, and strategies for remote work and how this can apply to your own work. This program is actually going to be uh, just the first of a series that we are kicking off tonight. Um, and there are many more resources on the web at architects.org. And we are uh, planning our next webinar for Friday on managing projects and workflow and technical considerations with Michael Kais, AIA from SMMA and Dan Galvin from Payette. Uh, we'll have more information on when uh, that uh, time will be happening. It's likely going to be in the afternoon, but we're trying to finalize that time and we'll be getting that out soon. So without further ado, I would like to turn it over to, uh, to Cynthia to kick us off. Thank you, Eric. Um, oh, Cynthia, do you want to so just go sorry, over the I rules forgot. for everybody? I should go yeah. over that. I'm the one to make the first mistake this evening. So. Um, we have about 300 people on this uh, webinar, and so we've, uh, we have some guidelines and etiquette for this evening. First of all, all of you will be on uh, mute mode. Uh, you can click, the, click on the microphone icon on the lower left side of your screen, um, and please, uh, please keep your microphones muted. Uh, the display, live views of, and the gallery view of your display, if you prefer not to show yourself to others, you may toggle off of this. During the Q&A, because we have so many uh, people that are on this, um, we are going to be focused primarily on the questions that were presented before, but we do ask that you continue to, to share your questions. So feel free to use the chat option on the lower uh, middle right hand side of your screen. And uh, we will be trying to follow up on those questions at a later date. And you should know that we are recording this meeting for on demand and we'll share it with everyone uh, once it's done. So uh, I wanna now say, uh, turn it over to Cindy and to kick it off. Thank you, Eric. Um, happy to share what Margulies Perucci has been doing over the past couple of years and most recently. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with Margulies Perucci, we are a firm located in downtown Boston. Um, it's a nice little snapshot of our firm, looking back at the skyline, which probably looks pretty different tonight um, in a few hours when the lights go down and there's not so many people working now. Our firm generally works Monday to Friday, standard business hours, and when Diana talks, you'll understand why I'm pointing that out as a key um, feature of our firm. We also have just under 50 people. We do a variety of work um, for different studios, different divisions. Uh, if you want to advance the slide, there we go. Yeah, so we work in four different areas. And the reason that's important is that our clients in these four different areas, whether they're real estate, uh, real estate development, healthcare, lab work, and science work, they have different demands on us. And for each of them, we've had to approach how we remote into our office and how we work on their projects a little bit differently due to their different security measures. So we started working remote um, in 2014. We had a set up a VPN, which is a virtual private network and connected that to our firewall. Back in 2014, we had 10 licenses and we have one to two people per month that would log in once in a while. It started as a way to let people who had children or loved ones at home that needed to be home to take care of them or perhaps adjust the standard working hours. 
we realized it started to become a really useful tool to everybody. And by 2015, we'd increased it to having one license for every two staff, uh, partly because they're sold in pockets of 10 or 25, but also because we didn't, we still wanted everyone to work in the office. We felt that was really key to who we are and how we work and that collaborative uh, teams was really important to us. When the big snowstorms of 2015 hit though, we realized that one license every two staff wasn't enough and we purchased additional licenses. So by 2017, uh, we had one license for approximately every one and a half staff. And that seemed to be enough flexibility when we had big snowstorms, um, other bad things happening in Boston and we were forced to work from home for a couple of days. Not everyone we found when they're working from home logs in remotely. Not everybody needs to be connected to the server the entire day. So that's partly why we didn't have as many licenses. Fast forward to this year and most recently these last couple of weeks and we've increased our licenses now. We bought another 10 pack just last week and we now have more licenses than we have staff. Um, but that ensures that everybody can get online at all times. There's no chance of people um, knocking one another off. And there's also, by having a couple extra licenses, allows for if somebody logs on but doesn't fully log off, um, there can sometimes be a little lag before it's on, that license frees up. So having extra licenses uh, for each of your staff is important. Um, on my next slide, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about how our individuals in the office all work a little differently. Uh, every person that works for our company can access the file service server outside of our office through the VPN. About 20% of our staff are working on laptops and the other 80% have a desktop computer in the office. And the reason for that is it has to do with what they do most commonly during their workday and how they then connect back to our servers a little differently. For people that have a desktop computer in the office, it's a high performance computer capable of rendering. So all of those people have to have a computer at home so they can remote into their computer that's connected to our, heart, our servers. The staff on laptops have two options. They can either leave the laptop in the office connected and remote in from another machine or they bring their laptop home and connect in that way. There's benefits and disadvantages to both, uh, most notably when it comes to Revit. Revit we have found, we don't use the Revit um, BIM 360 very frequently. Most often our files are saved on our hard drive, or not our hard drive, I'm sorry, on our servers in the office. And so when you're sending Revit over the VPN and syncing to central, you want that happening in the office whenever possible. So when someone's remoting in from a home computer to a computer physically in the office, all that data that's being sent when Revit syncs happens on hard wires in the office, which is fastest and most protected. When you're trying to sync from a laptop outside the office, you're now having to send all of that information through Revit, through your VPN connection, which can be a little bit tough because that's when bandwidth speeds your connection, uh, which are things you can't necessarily control, whether you have Comcast or another provider. And so most of our heavy Revit users doing production work or doing rendering work are working on a home computer that connects back to their physical computer sitting in the office. And their needs for that certainly change by phase, it changes by the project they're working on. And most notably, how they work depends on their demographics. I think we've all seen images like this next slide where it talks about how different demographics in the workforce work differently. And you know, the different generations have different preferred styles for communication. Uh, I will say the older workforce, because I am closer to the younger one, they prefer face-to-face -face communication. And for them, sometimes working from home is more doing the sit-down focused work and not so much uh, doing collaboration work. Whereas the younger staff in our offices, they really wanna be integrated with each other. They wanna talk to each other. They wanna bounce ideas off each other. And they're very comfortable doing that in a text form. They don't necessarily feel like they need to be face-to-face. -face. Um, so there is this divide in staff. And I think this happens in any office, but it certainly happens in ours with 50 people that you have a big swing of people that are very comfortable with technology, but also comfortable with short communication. And you have a, the other side of staff, which is 
they're comfortable with technology, but they're not experts at it. They're also, you know, most of them are willing to try new things, but they understand that they may not be the best at figuring out the technology things on their own. And they also want to be able to provide face-to-face -face communication, whether it's with our staff, whether it's with a client, a colleague, stuff like that. So there's that divide that technology and trying to work from home is fighting. And so what we've done as we transitioned this past week was try to find software that was going to support our staff without them having to learn something brand new. So we have a handful of different platforms and one of them is Skype. I think that's on my next slide. And Skype is a tool, oh, I'll talk about that in a second. So sorry, to back up our VPN addresses those different ways that people work because when you log into our VPN, you get this screen. This screen allows you to connect to our server in a multitude of ways. Um, if you're connecting remotely to a computer, you can see on this list where it says 18L CGM. That's my computer sitting in the office, and I can connect to it from outside the office, which then allows me to send Revit files um, easily that way. I can also access any of our project folders um, on the file server, and I could look just at our intranet or just at our email and connect that way. So our VPN set up to address all those different ways that different individuals and different demographics will work um, in different generations. So that it's not a, it's a one for all, but every, but how everyone uses it a little, a little bit different. So some of the tools we use, um, Revit, super important. Um, when you're working on a single file, it's not such a big deal. You just want to make sure you save your files back to the server at the end of the day. But when you're working in big groups, as many people do, um, you want to make sure you're not syncing at the same time. You can notice that in an office when multiple people sync, one of them will get something that, you know, it's waiting, it can't sync yet. But when you're not near each other and you, you need to open a line of communication so you can talk to one another about what's the right time to sync, you don't want to be syncing every five, 10 minutes. Um, so what's really important is to use the work sharing monitor and the work sharing monitor was an add-on in to 2015 of Revit. It's now called the communicator, um, which, so I have an image showing both. They basically do the same thing, although the communicator does a few extra perks, but it allows you to know who else is in the file with you. Uh, really important if you do something really bad and you're like, Oh, abort, forget about it but also just understanding who's been able to think lately, what changes might be in there. Um, so the communicator is a couple of their images um, that show, you know, who's in it, who's been able to think, who might have had a failure. Um, you know, this might help you if you're waiting on that person's information and you're thinking that they synced and they already made their changes, knowing whether they've been able to do that or not. It's especially important if people are working on a computer, say they're on a laptop and they're outside the office and they're just trying to send their information over their bandwidth. So it's got to get through whatever their home connection is as well as our connection at the office. So it's going through two different areas of bandwidth that you necessarily can't fully control. So this becomes even more important then. So that you can time when that's going to happen and make sure nobody else, you know, can um, sync while you're syncing. What can happen is a file can crash. Um, it could get locked up. It can knock people out. And that's really not great. You don't want to lose any information. You're all, your time is way too valuable for that. So the communicator and the work sharing monitor certainly help with that. The other tool is Skype um, to keep an open line of communication going. It could be that you want to communicate with someone who's maybe not in um, not in Revit, you know, or maybe it's something one person is in Revit and they're working and the other person's a project manager and they want to understand what you're working on, you have questions. So we use Skype for Business and the reason we did that, while it's transitioned now to Teams through Microsoft, is we all had Skype. It came with our Office 365 when we upgraded last year. So it's installed in everyone's machines, but at the time that we were talking about what did we want to do if we were all forced to work from home, 
we realized that there were already a dozen, if not more people in the office using Skype. They're mostly of the younger generation. Um, they're very comfortable with text messaging. They're very comfortable with technology. What that allowed us to do was to use them to help the rest of the people in the office figure out how to use this and get used to it. So last week we challenged all of our staff to log into Skype and try sending messages to each other. And while Skype can be used for conference calls, in this case we're primarily looking at Skype to open up a line of communication internally between people and allow them to share their screens. Uh, one other thing you can do is you can release control to someone else. So in this example I showed on the screen, I was working with my colleague about her lighting layout. She released control of her screen to me and I was able to zoom in and point to what I was talking about so that I could draw on her screen, um, I can move things, and it was a great tool to actually work together the way we often do and we sit down next to each other when we're fighting over the mouse to get our ideas across. So we can do that now without having to touch each other's mouse. Um, the next slide we had prepared, um, so external communication we wanted to treat a little differently. And the reason for that also goes back to what is our staff comfortable with? Back in the 90s, and I don't know what year I couldn't find when we started using it, but we started using uh, WebEx for a meeting. We started using it initially just as a way to get more people on a conference call. We use things like freeconferencecall.com, um, other you know, tools like that where you can call in, have lots of callers. Those meetings are always painful. Nobody loves a conference call, that's for sure. But we specifically went with WebEx because that, that was when we were really starting to share our screen with other people. Um, we then started using JoinMe a couple of years ago because we also wanted to have that capability to switch between sharing screens a little more fluidly, see people when they did have cameras. And we also started using JoinMe because people felt it was a little more intuitive. So they had a good comfort level with that. Each of these have their limits as to how many calls you can have, how many accounts can be working simultaneously. And as any business knows, there's also the cost consideration to have. Fast forward to this year, uh, we've really been pushing uh, Zoom because we have a lot of people that want to see our faces. And this was before all of this started happening. We had more and more requests to do video conferencing. So we set up with Zoom. They allow you to have a free account, uh, which was great. It's a good way to you know, kick the tires, figure out what works. And so we started using Zoom. As more people have been talking this past week and starting to work remotely, we realized that Skype was solving one little piece and our other platforms um, trying to communicate outside the office were lacking a little bit. So we beefed up, we bought 10 more licenses of Zoom. It's a business one, so it allows you to have the minimum of 10 teams. And we're started using that to do more external communication. And the reason Zoom works great is that it is super simple. Um, there's not a lot of buttons on it. Uh, it's really straightforward. And there's a really slow or really small learning curve on it. So people that are not as comfortable with technology and really want to be face to face have been able to pick up Zoom really easily. Um, and it's not so scary for them. There's a lot of scary stuff going on in the world today. And trying to keep your technology from being scary is, you know, a huge plus for both your users and your clients and the people you're trying to serve. Uh, I apologize, I do have a big dog um, who likes to in be included in conversations. So I've seen a bunch of uh, comments pop up on the chat window about why aren't you using this? Why did you do that? Um, and so I did want to talk a little bit about some of the decisions we made and why we made them. Because of some of our clients, uh, whether they are in the science sector um, or you know we do some defense projects, things like that where they're very secure and they're concerned about where our data is and who has access to it. When we set up our VPN, we wanted some really high standards of how you could get in. Um, so our VPN is connected to our firewall. It's not cloud-based. Um, when you log in, it forces you to run a virus scan on your computer. We have an antivirus that we use for our office 
and that same antivirus is installed on all of our staff's computers. What that means is everyone who goes out and buys a brand new laptop and it comes with Norton antivirus, now you have to uninstall that, install the same exact thing we're using in our office. That allows us to ensure that our computers at home get the same level of security as our computers in the office. Uh, we also run malware on them as well um, so that we feel everything is nice and tight and we can control things coming in. We specifically don't use cloud applications where we can avoid it. Our only um, cloud applications we have are Office 365 and Dell Tech. Um, unfortunately, that's the way both of those companies are going. Um, and so those are intentional. We want our clients to understand that their data is being held in our file servers on our site. It's not in the cloud. Um, we have some people that it's actually an agreement, part of our NDA and an agreement when we take a project that we will not have their data stored anywhere in the cloud. When it came to, I talked at the beginning about how some people are on a laptop and some are on desktop computers. And as much as everyone would love a laptop, it's really, um, really about giving them a computer that's gonna give them the performance they need. It may not be as convenient, but for a third of our office who both do production drawings and also do rendering, they all need a strong computer with a great graphics card, with enough hard drive space, with enough RAM and speed and everything that they can render there. And what that's allowed them to do is to log in from a mediocre computer at home that's really acting as a portal, um, but then they're attached you know, connecting to a stronger computer in the office that can run their stuff. Um, on my next slide, um, I want to just talk a little bit about the challenges we've had lately. So last week, when we sort of saw the writing about on the wall where things were going, we really um, wanted to test out our system. So we did a couple of tests last week. Um, it started with things like getting everybody in the office to try Skype. Um, and make sure they were comfortable with it. And again, one of the, someone asked, a couple of people asked about um, if you're using Teams, and we made the decision not to use Teams because you compare the two applications, Skype is really simple. Teams has a lot more buttons um, for someone who's not comfortable with working remotely to start or doing virtual meetings, you know, from home, Adding that extra Hello. technology hurdle is a little tough. Hello. So Hello. we tested out um, our infrastructure last week. We did two tests. Um, this is an example showing our more successful one. What we did is we forced everyone at night to go home and log in remotely. We asked them to try to put a stress test on the system, do what they might do for 15 minutes um, at night what they would might do if they were home working. So we double checked to see how many people were on at once, figure out how much of the bandwidth we thought they were doing. And then after that test was done, went back and took a look at our bandwidth. We did have one moment where it peaked. Um, we found out by going back to talking to everybody what happened then. And that peak happened to be somebody saving a large Revit file back to the central file over the server when they didn't have a computer um, in the office. We found that was our peak, which then just further reinforced that we need to have an open line of communication um, with our teams so that they can be proactive about when they want to send big amounts of data back to the office. Um, so I think I have one more slide in here before I hand it over to Diana. And you know, there's lots of other challenges. I could, we probably each could talk for two hours just about the different challenges and the decisions we've had to make in these, these past couple of weeks and, you know, this week. And so the key thing right now is keeping an open line of communication with our staff. Um, we have used Jostle for our intranet now, and you can see a snapshot, Jostle's available to people on their cell phones from home, from the office. And it's a great tool to have consolidation of information, whether it's just simple instructions on how to remote in, how to change the settings on your phone to redirect your phone calls to your cell phone, 
or in this case, it's a board that we started this week specifically about tips and tricks of what's been working for remote working um, and what hasn't been so that we're sharing information with each other. That was a lot of information. I probably rattled on past my time. So I'm going to hand this over to Diana Nicholas. Um, as mentioned, she's the president and CEO from SOM Architecture. Thanks, Cindy. That was great. A lot of good information. <clears throat> So um, SOM is uh, a firm that was founded in 2014. We have 23 people. Um, when we founded the firm in 2014, my partner and I decided that we wanted everyone to have remote work capability. And that went hand in hand with um, more flexible schedules or actually very flexible schedules. Uh, and we did that uh, because we wanted to sort of uh, look at new ways of working and we wanted the potential to attract and retain um, really top-notch staff. And so it's been quite an experiment, but um, it, it was really easy for us last Friday to email everyone and say, okay, we're going remote because we've all been doing this um, for several years. Uh, we have everyone come in on Mondays and we can talk a little bit more about the importance of regular communication, but generally we ask everyone to either come in or call into an all hands meeting at 10 o'clock on Mondays where we talk about all the projects and the staffing for the week and anything else that's going on with the firm. Uh, and then the rest of the week, our office is probably about a third full because people build their schedules around their project responsibilities, their client responsibilities uh, in the office. And so they come in when they need to or when their teams need to collaborate. So that's sort of the background for how we um, have been working remotely. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the tools, uh, as Cindy did. So we use a different VPN uh, program that's it's called Sonic Wallnet Extender, but there are so many of those available to you. Um, one of the lessons learned with this is that if you are just getting a VPN and you're getting going, make sure that you have enough accounts for your staff. I think a lot of people have probably upped that count in the last several days, but that's critical. Um, and then think about file sharing platforms for your clients. Um, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with these and uh, have different ways of communicating with your clients already. I would just, as a side note, say that the things that we're talking about today are really um, meant to address the needs of all types of firms. So some people may not have heard of technologies that other people have been using for years. So that's why I'm covering things like Dropbox. Um, I can tell you uh, when we started our firm, we had some Revit models on Dropbox and definitely uh, ran into some issues with that. So uh, you kind of have to do your research on what different platforms are gonna do when you go remote. Um, and you can start small and then work your way up without having to make a significant investment in many cases. So um, we use Slack extensively and we did start the firm with Skype. It is the, the instant messaging programs are absolutely critical to the way that we work. So for a number of reasons, um, programs like Slack um, allow you to show your online status. And so not only does that let us know, because we all have flexible schedules, who's online and working, but in this case, you can see that you can even, you have a little icon next to your name that sort of indicates where you are or what you're doing. So you can see there's somebody who doesn't have a green dot, Leah Fannin, and she's got a fork and a knife. So everyone knows she's at lunch. So I took this image yesterday. And so most of us are working from home, but there were a few people in the office. Um, and we like it because you can, you can have instant uh, communication with people, but you can also have um, group chats and then you can have channels. So you can see, down below that we have sort of general and IT talk and sort of topical channels. And then we have them that are project based. So that's really helpful for people that are working, you know, in a Revit model at the same time. And they want to chat about, you know, what's going on with their specific project. Um, Slack and, and all of these programs really allow you to paste in images or snippets. Um, if you don't know about the snippet tool, that's very popular in our office. It, it comes with your Windows software and you can just take um, a snapshot of any window that you make on your screen 
and then you can email it or paste it to people. So, so in this particular example, I pasted in um, an image from a PDF that Autumn had been working on. And in the snippet program, you could highlight things. So I had highlighted the dimension. So that's a tool that we'll use a lot to quickly answer questions. One of the themes that um, I sort of want to carry through what I'm saying today is that you should avoid using lots of email or we're all going to drown in the next few weeks. So these kinds of programs are really um, useful in that way. You can also upload um, PDFs and other file types within this program as well. So it's an easy way to do a quick file transfer if it's not too large. Um, and I would also just mention that uh, you can get Slack for free. We still use a free version of Slack at SOM, and um, we might expand that in the coming days, but we are right now still, still using the free version, so I recommend that. So we've talked about Revit. Cindy talked about Revit, um, which we also use. Um, we are doing some projects now in BIM 360, and um, that can be useful for certain project types and, and certain project phases, and it depends on who your collaborators are. But one of the things that I really wanted to emphasize today is that if you have a, B, a BIM 360 license, those people who are solely focused on working in Revit do not need to have a VPN connection. So if, if you're on BIM 360 and you just need your email and your modeling software, you, that might save some people an expense um, in getting a VPN connection. Uh, the other nice thing about BIM 360 is that means that your, your Revit work remains operational if the firm's server is down. Um, it does reduce the time for um, the sort of manual model sharing that we do uh, historically when we get the structural MEP models um, and we coordinate them with our architectural models. Uh, 360 is, has a full sort of project management capability as well. So document management, um, you can upload submittals and RFIs and that kind of thing. Um, the actual Revit work is more efficient through BIM 360. So uh, it does help if you have a lot of users that have slow connections. As Cindy was saying, that can become a real bottleneck for um, the efficiency of remote production in Revit. So we use a lot of GoToMeeting. Um, you can use Skype, you can use Zoom. There are lots of things that you can use uh, or WebEx, I didn't, I meant to say not Skype, but um, there's a whole range of these solutions. But one of the things that we like about GoToMeeting is that it's very easy for people on the team to take control of the screen. So we can do that with PDFs or with their Revit model. And we go back and forth a lot, but you can also draw and sketch on, on uh, GoToMeeting and several of these platforms. And I think, you know, as everybody's looking at how to do the design collaboration piece, that's really important. The ability to still sort of sketch, even if it's digital, uh, remains critical. Um, just a lesson learned. If you have multiple accounts on GoToMeeting, which we do at some, um, we've had to work out a system in our office so that we don't uh, schedule meetings on top of one another. Um, so if, if a lot of people are using one of the accounts, then they, they need to mark if they're going to have repeating meetings uh, and go to so that other people don't book over that. So a lot of the questions that came in to the BSA registration uh, for this event asked about how do you um, check people's work and how do you make sure that the red lines are picked up and that sort of thing. Uh, I think a lot of you are probably aware that Bluebeam has uh, great capabilities for that, but if you haven't considered Bluebeam, I would encourage that as something to consider now. We have found it to be very helpful for redline sessions. We do our internal QAQC all in Bluebeam, so one of our senior technical architects will review the drawings and note them in red, as you can see on this drawing, and then our, our production teams set up what's called a Bluebeam session where uh, everybody can comment on the red lines and then they can highlight those that are complete and it becomes, there's a record of all that's done. So if you look in the lower left-hand corner of this image, you can see, you know, people were, uh, when they joined, what they did, and you can sort of uh, check the history of what's happened and make sure that, you know, everything's being picked up 
but people aren't duplicating efforts. That also allows uh, project managers or project leads to really understand the progress of um, getting through the red lines. So I'm going to talk about the cell phone just for a minute, which we all have. Um, at SOM, we all use our personal cell phones as our work cell phones. Other people have two phones. Either way, uh, when, you're, when you're working remotely, again, you just don't want to email everyone to death. Uh, so the cell phone still provides um, a really good opportunity. And when we're all working remotely, you, do, you, need, you need to talk to people a little bit more um, in non-digital ways, I feel. So, but the cell phone also allows you to just be more available. You're not in the office. You might be, you know, in a different part of your house and somebody's trying to reach you during the workday and you have your cell phone, um, you're available. Obviously, we all know how to text. FaceTime can be really useful. And even on the construction site, I think that could be used more. And again, sometimes it's just nice to have a face-to-face -face conversation. Um, but it also, your phone's also going to allow you to expand the capabilities of those other platforms that we've talked about, such as the GoToMeeting app, the Skype app, the Slack app. So think about different ways that you can use your cell phone. I mean, you may be sketching on Trace and then taking photos and sending them to your colleagues, um, but there are so many apps out there that can help you with the collaboration remotely. So a little bit about decisions. Um, one of the things I just thought I would touch on is sort of the guidelines that firms choose to sort of recommend or um, require as they set up um, remote work. It's going to vary by firm, depends on the culture. It may even vary by the team. Uh, people have to decide, are we going to have specific work hours? Or are we going to have a more open schedule? Um, you know, in these days, a lot of people may need a little bit of flexibility if they're at home with their children or with other people or if they have any kind of responsibilities um, they mean, may need a little flexibility so people need to think about um, what their schedule looks like and communicate it amongst the team um, you need to decide if you're going to have established times for check-ins uh, meetings collaboration as i mentioned at SOM, we have a weekly meeting where we the whole team is together but uh, the rest of our, pro our project teams all establish times when they are going to have either a weekly project meeting um, or if they're gonna have a progress sort of report during the week. So there's a lot of coordination on Monday and understanding how the rest of the week looks in terms of communication. Um, you need to understand what sh how people will access shared resources. So for instance, um, at SOM, we have a couple of the Revit licenses where like five people have access to the license. So you need to understand who's gonna need those types of licenses. Um, same thing, we have a Rhino machine set up in our office and it's a similar technology to what Cindy described for how they use Revit. Um, if you need to use the Rhino license, you can remote into that and use that particular software. And then you just need to be really clear on your BIM workflow and sort of, it's going to be an adjustment for certain teams who are used to sitting together and constantly talk about what's happening in the model. And you're gonna to have to work out the communication um, within the model and how the model is being built. So challenges and solutions. I wanna talk a little bit about the, the idea of change, which is not easy for any of us. But I want to be very clear to everyone that this is not a technological change solely. This requires a new mindset and it's really going to challenge the status quo and that's going to vary uh, widely across firms but it will require thinking about how we work differently we're all going to have domestic distractions and different responsibilities uh, while we're working remotely um, and as i said a minute ago just with everything that's going on right now people may need a little bit more flexibility but firms need to talk to each other about how that's managed in order to keep the work going and have everyone um, remain accountable. And then, you know, there are areas where you actually don't need to think about change. And so I would say if you have established workflow protocols, try to stick to those that you can. Like, um, don't save any files to your local drive other than your Revit local file. Um, 
if you are saving to central, you know, establish what that frequency will be. Um, hopefully you're using the WorkShare monitor, but if you're not, again, it's just think about the things that you routinely do in the office and see what of that can translate to the remote environment. So accountability is something that comes up a lot when I talk about some people want to know, how do you know people are getting the work done? What are they doing at home? How can you tell? We are in a deliverable based business. You can tell if people are getting their work done. Um, it does require a lot of communication though. But fundamentally, we all need to try to respect and trust that the people we're working with are taking their careers seriously. And if they're not, you're gonna know that and you're gonna have a conversation with them. Um, make sure that people do have some indicator of whether or not they're online. I don't, it doesn't matter what kind of software you use, uh, there are so many that will um, help you designate sort of where you are, what you're doing, and if you're available. So one of the lessons learned that we have at SOM is that you really have to either have young staff who are good at asking questions or really encourage them to do so. Um, I get a lot of questions about how we mentor our staff because I think we all have a traditional image in our heads of you know a more senior architect sitting right next to the junior architect and not to take away from that fabulous process but um, you can mentor people well remotely um, and, in, and in some case it even I think allows for a more um, a more intimate conversation because you're often going to have two people that are not sitting in a big room who, who may be having a slack discussion about specific things and the young people have more opportunity you know, to get into more detail and ask more questions and that kind of thing. Um, again, everyone needs to have a real sense of what their responsibilities are on a team. Um, that's something that you're going to want to review constantly with the team. Um, and then understand what the sort of routine is for reporting how your tasks are completed. So there are lots of different uh, productivity software, uh, software products that can help you with this. Some people like Trello, which also is a free version and you can assign tasks people. Another one that we use is um, Todoist and you can assign people tasks on that as well and they can be divided by project and that kind of thing. So that may help with accountability some when you're in the remote environment. Okay, so let's talk about design collaboration. Uh, a lot of people really question the notion that you can collaborate on design. You know, in the questions that we got um, on the, in the registration, people talk about how design is a team sport and you know, the more senior people don't really know how this is going to work, but I can tell you, having done this for several years now, it is absolutely possible. It does take some time, and there are moments where, yes, face-to-face -face would be the ideal scenario, but to get through these, the coming weeks, and hopefully not, but potentially months, think about how this is going to work for your team. So, again, you're going to use a conferencing or an instant messaging software. I really like GoToMeeting, but there are so many of them. And encourage everyone that's joining a conference call to, to draw if they want to. Um, you can create a virtual pinup in a lot of ways. I mean, the obvious one being Pinterest, you can put a lot of images there, but um, there are a lot of different ways that uh, you can allow people to contribute ideas uh, and then all review them together in a virtual environment. Uh, you need to be really clear about who's on a, on a conference call when you're collaborating on the design and then make sure that everyone is encouraged to participate. Maybe you give people assignments before they come to that so that they can have something they need to share or talk about or present the work that they've been doing. Um, we like to use the BIM model a lot in the meetings because we can uh, sort of look at the look at everything real time and understand the progress and the design decisions that are being made. Um, take photos of sketches that you've done at home. Send people precedents. Um, think about concepts that you can communicate for the whole team. And the other thing you might want to do is, is occasionally invite the client. I think the clients are definitely looking um, to our industry at the moment to keep the work going. Uh, we've heard that from a lot of clients. And it might be nice for them to understand sort of the state of the work because you're not going to be meeting and presenting all the time. 
Um, and they may, you know, I think they would like to see how you use the BIM model and that kind of thing. So just a consideration when you're uh, ready to share your work, but you're not going to be meeting with your client. Um, so the, the construction administration piece of this is uh, undoubtedly the most challenging. Um, so you can continue to use virtual to tools and FaceTime, and I think there'll be a lot more WebEx and GoToMeeting in, in those uh, contexts. Um, some of the basic recommendations that I've heard include that if, if you have, if you have to send someone to the site, send one person and try to send a key decision maker so that they can keep the construction moving. You may want to look at your company's safety protocols um, and add information on that. And you may want to check in with your insurance. All of this information, though, is constantly evolving. And I know that this is one of the areas that the BSA is looking at uh, in more detail and will be in touch with more people in the industry to see how construction is evolving. Um, we understand that while most construction in Boston is coming to a halt, uh, not all of it is, and that seems to be exclusive to Boston. So I think we're all gonna continue to learn more about how this is handled. Okay, so with that, we're going to move into um, sort of a curated question and answer period. Uh, again, this is based on the questions that were received during the registration. Um, we do appreciate all the chat questions, though. And again, BSA is collecting those, and they're going to try to take up various topics from those within subsequent, subsequent sessions. And I think the one that Eric mentioned next will actually be great for the uh, technological piece. So Cindy, do you want to kick off the question? Sure. Thanks, Diana. So the first question I was going to cover was, are there systems that are particularly relevant for small firms? I think we've mentioned a bunch of them through this talk, but one thing I wanted to start with clarifying is we purchased Pulse Secure for our firm. The initial cost was you buy the infrastructure, you're not pay paying for individual licenses on a monthly basis. So our initial, initial firewall cost for Pulse Secure and the firewall combined was about $1,300. Um, that's not the biggest one um, out there. There's, there may be less expensive options, there may be more expensive options, but the key thing with this was that we bought it and you're not paying a monthly fee on top of that, which I think is helpful for small firms. Also, things we've mentioned, Slack has a free version, Zoom has a free version. It also has one that has a little bit more for just $15 a month. Join me ranges for 10 to $30 a month. A lot of those, if you go online, they want you to sign up and agree to a year. But what we've found is if you call a company and tell them you're testing it out, you're a small business, maybe you mentioned that you do nonprofit work, they'll let you sign up and just pay for monthly instead of committing to a year contract with it. The other one, um, and we said we use Skype for business because that's what was installed on our computers when we installed Office 365. It now comes with Microsoft Teams, but you can also get Microsoft Teams um, by itself. You don't have to have Microsoft Office platform to use it um, and it's free. So I'd say don't be afraid that just because you're a small business that all of these things are super costly. Go out there, try out the small ones, the free ones, um, and give them a shot. I think the biggest thing is to start getting your offices communicating and connected. Thanks, Cindy. Um, so another question we got was about um, somebody that's concerned with productivity and efficiency, and how you how you can how can you trust employees to stay focused? And along that line, should billing time change? So. I would say that it's really critical that people work, just focus on delivering the work. So outline the expectations of what you want done and expect your staff to rise to the occasion. That said, this is, this is a stressful time for people. Um, they may not be at their best. A lot of people are, are very worried about the situation while, while others are less so. Some people will thrive working from home and others will struggle with it. So you have to sort of be, um, you have to, I think, just prepare yourself that productivity and efficiency will take a little while to even out. 
um, and will probably go up and down depending on what's going on. I would say don't change anything about billing. Um, everybody needs to keep billing right now. And um, I think that as long as you're meeting your project requirements and you're getting your um, deliverables out in good shape, um, I think that that's something that will, will, will be celebrated and you will be able to bill in the same way that you normally would have. If you have hourly employees, you can talk to them openly um, about how you know, they may need to adjust their hours or not. But I think that generally, I would just say focus on making sure people are getting deliverables complete and that you are clearly articulating what is expected of those people. Great, thanks Diana. The next question I have is how to collaborate and work through small issue questions that usually are taken care of by turning around and asking a quick question. And this one, this is where using Skype for business or whatever messaging tool works great for you is so important. Um, generationally having people, you know, that maybe aren't as comfortable asking questions or, you know, just pairing them up with people making sure they have an open line of communication, using another tool that way. So while we have Skype and everybody can um, connect through it, one of the things we're doing this week is our project managers are meeting. And one of the discussion points is going to be, who out there are the people that maybe need that extra ear? What are our mentors doing? And get them to also open up you know, those lines of communication through an instant messenger and just let them know that they're there and that way you can have you know, a quick you know, conversation, question, answer, period, and being able to show your screen is huge to share examples um, or draw on top of someone's drawing. Another question we got was, what are client expectations during these times? Um, as I said earlier, it seems in the, in the clients that we've spoken to and others at the BSA that I've talked to, our clients are definitely still expecting us to deliver. Um, I think that uh, some people at the BSA are trying to get more information from uh, various clients on, on how they plan to approach the situation. Um, but I think that there's a basic assumption that most firms have gone remotely. And I think that comes from the fact that so many other industries uh, are already remote and they're expecting us um, to, to be in the same boat. Um, I will also mention that the BSA has, has reached out to a lot of the agencies that architects are working for to sort of check in and the work is continuing and they are going to have staff there that are uh, able to still process all the invoicing. So I think that's also a clear sign that they're expecting us all to keep going. So. Cindy? Another question we got, yeah, another question we got was if, uh, or how people are dealing with slower speed connections when multiple people are working from home. And the slower speed connections could be twofold. It could be that things are slower because you have multiple people connecting to a server at once. The other issue you may find, and it's something I deal with most times when I work from home, is that my, my connection I have at home is not that great. I don't live in an area where there's high speed internet uh, fortunately, I happened to buy a Wi-Fi supplement pack from my Verizon carrier, and so I have that, but it's still, you know, that's as fast as I can get. I can't work nearly as fast and connect to the server as I would if I was in the office. So it's, again, about communicating to people if you need to be accessing the same file. Sometimes it's about planning your day a little better to spread out when you're going to be doing something that might have a big drive on the server. For me, since I have a hard time connecting uh, to large Revit files, I typically will push that off um, standard business hours. And if I need to work on it, sometimes it's just about copying the file to my computer so I can poke in around and check what people are doing and maybe I'm not actually drawing anything. I'll download that at like 10 o'clock at night when I think less people are on there. So I'm not slowing down the bandwidth of the office. And I also tend to have less people in my neighborhood also eating up bandwidth in the area. So it's trying to be proactive about how I use up bandwidth. Great. So we're, we're running short on time and we have a few more minutes. Um, the BSA asked 
both of us to comment on sort of what our key takeaway would be in in uh, talking to people about remote work. So I guess what I would have to say is that people should brace themselves not only for what we're going to be going through in the coming weeks and how that's going to challenge the way that we have worked historically, but be open-minded uh, to the fact that it's going to change how we work moving forward beyond the current um, uh, crisis that we're going through. I think people are going to see what is possible. I think they're gonna see what's challenging about remote work. And a lot of people are also going to demand that they have, uh, I think, some different opportunities in the way that they work and where they work and when they work. Um, so I think everyone will look at this experience uh, and, and will return to their studios with different eyes and different ways of thinking about collaboration. Cindy, how about you? What's your takeaway? So I think my big one is that what can be a challenge now is keeping up um, everybody's morale. There's a lot going on, which is very stressful. And being able to focus on our work is a great way to get away from the drama of what's going on in the world. But it's more importantly about thinking about, we all really like what we do and in our firm especially, we really like working with each other. And so we wanna find a way to reinforce it. While we're away from each other, um, that connection we have together. And we keep tossing around ideas of how to do that. But since today was St. Patty's Day, um, I reached out to a bunch of my colleagues and I'd asked them, you know, their thoughts on how to keep above his morale. And they're like, oh, well, Jason's hosting a virtual meeting night and it's an office get together to celebrate St. Patty's Day. And so they all connected, they all turned video on um, and they all sat in their own homes and had beers and, and did cheers to each other for St. Patty's Day. And the feedback I'm getting back, because they're still answering me now, is that it's great. It was great to see people relaxed and in their home environment giving each other things to focus on and joke about and just relate to each other. And so I think that's my big takeaway is that, you know, making sure that we're all still relatable to one another. We're not, we're not strangers. We, we all are an active tight knit firms and a tight knit community and we need to not lose that during this time. Great. Diana, so no, Eric, Cindy, any closing I thoughts? Wanna... <laughs> I want to thank both of you for for this uh, this hour and uh, and to thank all of you for joining us. You know this is an experiment for us and and much like the firms, uh, our chapter is also uh, going through uh, major changes in how we operate. And your suggestions, I think, have been phenomenal uh, in in helping us too. And uh, and we would love your feedback, all of you that have participate in this. Um, we want your thoughts and recommendations. What are other sessions that you, uh, you need help with? And also, if you know of speakers, uh, several people I know were asking, is this session being recorded? And the answer is yes, and we plan to post this. We also uh, are looking to do another session on Friday. And that will be focused on managing projects and workflow and, and technical considerations. Um, we are finalizing the time on Friday and we will be getting that announcement out very soon. Uh, and uh, please uh, share with us your thoughts, ideas, potential speakers. Um, and I know I, I really want to reiterate uh, two of the things that Diana and Cindy talked about. And the first really is that uh, this is gonna be a culture change for, for everyone and uh, be, being flexible and being able to communicate and adapt to the changes and also focusing on how we support each other through this is incredibly important. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, talk about washing your hands, um, keeping social distance. I think the other part of the conversation that has to be part of this is how do we be kind to each other? How do we support each other? Um, and that uh, we can, we will be getting through this and uh, it is through the, the advice of folks like the two of you and all of you online that will help us. So on behalf of uh, the, the members of the BSA, 
thank you, Diana and Cynthia, for, for your time. And uh, we hope to see many of you on Friday. Thank you all.